This part of the novel is titled The Sieve and the Sand. Ever heard someone say they have a memory like a sieve? Sometimes, even when you try really hard to remember something, it just doesn't stick. In the world of Fahrenheit 451, that's what's happened to people's brains since they no longer bother with books. And our protagonist, or main character, Guy Montag, is starting to get worked up about it. Well, wouldn't you? We pick up where we left off at the end of part one. Guy is reading to his wife, Mildred, or Millie, from his collection of books. Sounds like a romantic thing to do on a rainy afternoon, right? Not in their world. Reading is a deadly act of rebellion. As they read and talk, Guy remembers his neighbour, Clarice, how she was interested in everyone and everything. Clarice was a reader. Maybe they can learn from her. But not so fast. There's a faint scratching at the door. Shh, don't move. It's the mechanical hound. Guy is terrified of that eight-legged killing machine, but Mildred just thinks it's a normal dog. She couldn't be more wrong. She's more worried that Guy's boss, Captain Beatty, will find out about Guy's hidden books. What if Beatty punishes them by burning the house and destroying their TV screens? You see, Millie only cares about her family. Not her husband, but the family she sees on television. She even says that these TV people tell her things. Now that's creepy. Someone needs a reality check. Right now, Guy's getting frustrated with Millie. To add to the tension, there's a bomber plane overhead. This is a world with atomic wars and threats on every corner. No one wants to talk about the less privileged nations. But Guy's social conscience is now stirring. He realises that the rest of the world works while they play. Guy wonders, where can he turn to for help? The answer lies in one of his memories. Guy has already met someone who can teach him how to escape ignorance and apathy through books. The teacher's name is Faber. He's an elderly man who Guy encountered in a park a year ago. Faber was once an English professor. When they met, he recited some poetry to Guy. He also gave Guy his address in case the firemen decided to track him down later. There's a sense of unfinished business with Faber, but it's still so hard to know who to trust. Guy dials Faber's telephone number and waits a long time before it's answered. When Faber picks up, Guy asks him if he knows how many copies of the Bible, Shakespeare and Plato are left in the country. Understandably, Faber thinks it's a trap and hangs up. Meanwhile, Millie is laughing in the hall. She's excited because her friends are coming over. They're just like Millie, compulsive TV watchers who've swapped their realities for what they see on screen. Millie wants Guy to get rid of the books. How dare he threaten her lifestyle with its many screen walls? Guy asks Millie a question. Does her TV family love her? She can't answer that. So he leaves the house to find Faber. Guy takes the subway, holding a copy of the Bible in plain sight. Risky. He tries to read and memorise it, but the train radio ads are too loud and distracting. Guy's battle to retain a few words triggers a painful childhood memory. A cousin offered Guy money if he could keep sand in a sieve. Of course, Guy failed at this task. It was a cruel joke. But now the sieve symbolises or represents Guy's adult brain. Everything he reads slips through like sand. He must fix this. Surely Faber knows how. Things are changing. Guy's permanent smile is gone. He's no longer beaming at his dystopian world. He's started a quest that will ultimately lead him elsewhere.
When Guy reaches Faber's house, he shows Faber the Bible he's carrying. Faber is scared at first, but then he lets Guy in. He sees the stolen book and knows that Guy is brave. Guy has come to ask Faber for his help. He wants to know more about why his society treats books like dangerous weapons. Knowing the truth will set him free. Can Faber help Guy to see what's really going on? Faber's not a religious man, but he's very excited to see the Bible up close. He even wants to sniff it. In this world, Jesus has become a TV character, a shiny hero of the small screen who's kept busy saying sweet nothings and promoting various products. It's almost funny. This is a world where the goggle box has replaced spirituality. Can't have people wondering about the true meaning of life. Faber regrets not sticking up for books. He tells Guy that he did not speak and thus became guilty. Guilty of what? Of staying silent while the world around him changed. You see, Faber means well, but he's not a brave man. Faber delivers an impressive lecture to Guy on the topic of books. Books are quality, he says. They're visions of life. They've got depth and complexity. They scare people because they make them think. TV is only a nasty claw that encloses you. Gee, that's a vivid picture. Guy is becoming even more courageous by this point. He's got nothing to lose. He's got a plan. Perhaps he and Faber could join forces and start a printing press to bring a few more books into the world. Guy even plans to hide books in the houses of firemen. The firehouses will be forced to burn up. They could try and infiltrate the system from within. Faber has doubts. Shocked by Faber's weakness, Guy starts ripping pages out of the Bible. That wakes the old man up. Faber immediately panics and agrees to help. He even gives Guy one of his inventions, a green bullet earphone. When Guy wears it, Faber can listen in on his conversations and give him advice. Has Guy found freedom just to become someone else's mouthpiece? What's the advantage in that? Well, Faber has a lot of wisdom. Through the earphone, Faber can help Guy verbally battle Captain Beatty and anyone else who comes his way. Remember, Guy is still recovering from having a mind like a sieve. War is all around them that night. They're even mobilising men to fight, and Guy can feel the tension in the air. Faber promises to read to him over the earphone to help him sleep. Nothing like a bedtime story. Once Guy arrives home, it's been invaded by Millie's silly friends with their empty smiles. Everyone's busy looking awesome and being dazzled by the parlour walls of the television. Harmless fun. Or is it? It's all too shallow for Guy. He can't stand how oblivious they are to the crisis around them. Don't they care that there's a war on? Apparently not. Don't they care about their husbands fighting? No. Why think when there's the distraction of bright lights and colours on the screen? Millie's friends include a woman who despises children and a mother who sticks her own children in boarding schools to avoid them. Where's the love? Guy can't bear being around these housewives any longer. Now that he's seen the light, he's itching to convert them to his way of thinking. Guy starts with a classic line, let's talk. The women are immediately uncomfortable. These are ladies who give their votes to politicians because they have nice-sounding names and look handsome. Not the best audience to read poetry to. Faber warns Guy through his earphone that he'll ruin everything, but Guy's desperate enough to try. He reads a beautiful poem called Dover Beach, but his words echo into emptiness. 
One of the women starts crying when she hears the poem. She doesn't know why, and no one knows how to react. This is what hearing a good poem can do. But now, the women are angry. How dare Guy try to upset their fun night with the family? Why did he have to read to them? It's too much of a challenge to their simple minds. The scene is set for conflict. Millie can't cope. Her friends have left and she's reaching for the sleeping pills. It's all too confronting. When Guy returns to work, he has Faber in his ear for one last showdown. Captain Beatty knows what he's been up to. Reading never goes unpunished in this world. But first, there's a fire to start. Captain Beatty and Guy roar around in the fire engine. Is it just another night doing their job? They stop right in front of Guy's house. Guy's going to have to burn down his own house. Can this world get any crazier? We hope you enjoyed this Schooling Online production. For more easy lessons, check out our other videos.